WWE Network also released a new episode of WWE Untold. They did one last year on the Shawn Michaels Undertaker Hell in a Cell match at Bad Blood the night that Kane made his debut. And they interviewed, you know, Glenn Jacobs for it. It was very well done. Very well done. This latest one, though, covering the Shawn Michaels Kurt Angle match from WrestleMania 21, is their best one yet. And the match is one of the top 10 greatest WrestleMania matches of all time. Maybe even top five. If I sat down and really thought about it and put put a list together, uh, it's possible it could crack the top five. But if not, top 10 for sure. It's, it's a match that when it was over, Bobby Heenan called it the greatest match that he had ever seen. And Bobby Heenan has seen a lot of matches in his day. And he was gushing over it, apparently, and said that it was the best match he had ever seen. Kurt Angle himself, in this special, called it the greatest match of his career. Now, it has to be be this, I would think, or the Benoit match from Royal Rumble in 2003. But, I mean, he's, he's sitting down to be interviewed by WWE. So, he probably realizes, even if he felt that it was the Benoit match, he probably realizes, hey, I really can't say that on a WWE show. So, we'll go with this one. Either way. Either way. It is a fantastic match, and this was a nice look back at what went into it, how we got there, the match itself. Uh, The talking heads in here were Shawn. They sat down with Shawn Michaels. They sat down with Kurt Angle, Michael Cole, and Johnny Gargano. Those were the four talking heads. I guess with Gargano, they wanted to get the perspective of a current star who was a fan back then watching the match, and Gargano is probably the biggest HBK mark that they have in that entire company. So, of course he would want to be part of something like this. There there were parts of this where Gargano came across <laughs> like the biggest wrestling geek that you have ever seen. But in a way, it's kind of endearing, right? Because you can see how much of a fan he really is. Gargano says uh, that this generation of stars was influenced by Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle. And you can tell if you watch any NXT TakeOver show, you see their influence written all over it. Although I don't remember Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle doing uh, Destroyers. In every single match. But uh, apparently their influence is all over the current generation of, of talent. Michaels talked about injuring his back in 98. Having to leave and go away for four years. And when he came back, he had to adapt. He had to adjust his style. Uh, he said that in his day, it was about making it look real, but not really hurting the other guy. And then he came back and he realized, well, that went out the window. <laughs> and guys were just going in there and beating the piss out of each other. I love that analogy, and the reason I love it is because I first heard Bret Hart use that analogy many years ago. Bret Hart once said, and I I absolutely, I think it's a great analogy, and I can understand it, and I can agree with it, that the real art of pro wrestling is giving the illusion of hurting your opponent when in reality you're not harming a hair on their head. You're not hurting them at all. You know, guys are going to get black and blues, they're going to get a busted lip, you know, a chipped tooth. Stuff like that, it's unavoidable. But the art of professional wrestling is making people believe that you are really hurting the person across from you in the ring. And in reality, when you go to the back, you shake hands, you hug, everybody's healthy, and nobody is hurt. And that's the real art of it. I mean, it's easy to smack somebody in the face. It's easy to smack somebody upside the head or in in their eardrum, for real. But to make it look like you hurt the guy when you really didn't, I would imagine that that's a lot harder to do. You know, there are guys who come in who used to box or they used to play in the NFL. And I would imagine for those guys, it's an adjustment to have to pull their punches and to have to just pull back. You know, they're, they're so intense. It's It's got to be difficult, I think, for them to adjust and say, listen, you know, your job is to not go in there. <laughs> Or if you're an MMA fighter, there's a lot of MMA fighters who have transitioned over to pro wrestling. They're used to going in the octagon and trying to kill their opponent. The goal is to beat them into submission or knock them out. I would imagine there's a learning curve involved where when you go over to pro wrestling, it's all showmanship. You know, it's like you got to pull those punches, you got to pull those kicks, you got to pull those knees. It's got to be a hard thing to do. But I always thought that was a great way when I would hear Brett say that. It's a great way of describing the art of what these men and women do every time they set foot into the ring. Gargano talked about the Royal Rumble match in 2005, hearing about reports, rumors online, but you know, you can't believe everything you read. 
that they were preparing for a Sean Kurt match at WrestleMania, but it wasn't until he saw the two of them interact in the Royal Rumble match that he got really pumped. You know, Michaels dumped Kurt, Kurt came back in, dumped Michaels, and then he knew. He knew that they were off to the races for WrestleMania. And I have to say, that 2005 Royal Rumble match, low-key, is one of my favorite Rumble matches. I say low-key, uh, and I'm not talking about Cabal. I say low-key because I don't talk about it as much as I do say, oh, I don't know, the 1992 Royal Rumble. I think I've mentioned that maybe a couple of times over the years. Uh, but I don't mention this one as much. It's not as good as that one. But I thought it was a very enjoyable Rumble that year. Sean talked about the build to the match. They were on different shows. They had to find a way for it to work. And they did you know, a whole bunch of angles. Kurt Angle would do, uh, you know, I think he, on SmackDown, he issued some kind of uh, open challenge for local talents to come wrestle him. And, you know, Sean was dressed up as a cameraman and did the big reveal and attack Kurt. So all, all this, you know, back and forth type stuff. Gargano's favorite part of the entire build, his favorite part of the entire angle is my favorite as well. One of the all-time great segments in SmackDown history. When Kurt Angle danced out to Sexy Boy, and he called out Sensational Sherry. Couldn't even tell you the last time Sensational Sherry was on WWE television, aside from her uh, Hall of Fame induction. And it's a shame what happened to her. It's a shame, you know, the back problems and the pain pills and everything else, and you know, had she been able to get her back fixed, you know, maybe she'd still be here with us. It's uh, it's really just bullshit what happened to her. But um, Sherry was great. Sherry was fantastic. You know, I couldn't help when I was watching the Dark Side of the Ring on Benoit. And they were talking about Nancy, you know, woman. And her role as a wrestling valet and how she doesn't really get the attention that she deserves. And she played, you know, she played her part to the hilt. And it made me think of Sherry. Sherry's the other one I would think of. Now, Sherry, un unlike woman... Sherry wrestled. Sherry was a wrestler, but she was also a valet and a manager and a damn good one. And she could take bumps and do a lot of things that a lot of the women back then weren't doing. And she she gets her just due, but also maybe not enough. Maybe not as much as she should. So when she came out here, of course she used to manage Shawn Michaels. And Kurt had already beaten Marty Jannetty on TV, Shawn's old partner. Now we got Shawn's old manager to come out. He was digging back in Shawn Michaels' history. And then they get in the ring, and Kurt says, well, Shawn Michaels thinks he's so great because he sang his own song. Well, anything you can do, we can do better. And the woman's voice that you hear at the beginning of Shawn Michaels' theme song, every time he comes prancing out, is Sherry. So he puts the mic in Sherry's face, Sherry does the screams, and then we get the rendition of Sexy Kurt. He's just a sexy Kurt. He'll make your ankle hurt. <laughs> it's, it's, Kurt, Kurt was awesome. I mean, what can I say? Kurt, Kurt could do it all. Kurt could be intense. He could look like he's going to rip your head off one second. And then the next minute we get goofy Kurt. Who's doing stuff like this. Who's, who's singing sexy Kurt. Truly one of the greatest segments in SmackDown history. And then, of course, at the end... He threw Sherry down and put her in the ankle lock, and Kurt laughed and said, you'd never be able to see that today. Amen to that. People would have a conniption fit if they did that on uh, WWE television. So then we get to the match itself, WrestleMania 21, and Sean says that Pat Patterson was the one to suggest, you know, you do a slap. Do a hard slap at the beginning of the match. And so he used that slap here, and it worked. You know, before they even locked up, Kurt had a big smirk on his face, and Sean smacked him right across the face. And Kurt told the story about a week or so before the match. I guess they were getting together to talk about it. And they really didn't know each other. They really weren't friends. They didn't really know each other very well. And as they're talking and they're, they're you know, preparing for this match, he says that Michaels turns to him and goes, I just want you to know, I'm not afraid of you. And Kurt said he he had no idea where that came from because he thought... I'm a pretty easy guy to work with in the ring. Uh, you know, I don't know where that came from. But he figured that Sean was just standing up for himself. He probably knew Kurt's reputation. He knew Kurt was a shooter. Uh, yeah, great amateur wrestler, Olympian, Olympic gold medalist, all this stuff. And he just wanted to kind of give him a fair warning. So that when we get in the ring, if you try to take advantage of me, we're going to have a problem. 
I will say that if Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels ended up having a problem with each other, I would pick Kurt Angle 10 times out of 10. Kurt Angle would turn Shawn Michaels into a fucking Bachman pretzel. So Gargano's talking about the match and all the mat work they did early on and uh, trying to feel each other out. This is the first time the two of them ever worked together. This is their very first match. They went in there and had one of the greatest matches of all time. That tells you the chemistry, the instant chemistry that these two had when they stepped into the ring together. And Sean said, one of the only submissions I even know is a short arm scissor. And so I put the short arm scissor on Kurt. This was this was like match anatomy here. This, that's what this was. Uh, and it was fascinating to listen to the two of them just talk about all the different spots and the German suplex attempt off the apron, which looked like Kurt was in a very compromising sexual position with Sean. Uh, but he was trying to German suplex him off the apron, couldn't do it. And when Sean gave him a low blow and avoided catastrophe with that move, the crowd booed. And Kurt laughed and said, I think the reason they booed is because they really wanted to see me hit the move. Because the problem is, if I would have hit the move, Shawn Michaels wouldn't exist anymore if I had given him a German suplex off the apron. Angle said the biggest move of the match was Michaels doing a springboard dive out onto Angle on the announce desk. Table did not break. And Michael Cole is interviewed. He's laughing. He says, uh, you know, surprise, surprise. The tables are always supposed to break. And this one did not. And Michael said when that happened, the audience usually goes, oh, it didn't break. It's a botch and all that stuff. But then they realize that it hurts even more. When the table doesn't break, when the table does not give, it is more painful. Which is, I guess, one way to look at it. Still a botch, but one way to look at it. So Angle said uh, he needed a moment to really collect himself and catch his breath. He had blood coming out of his mouth. He saw the blood. He said, oh, this is good. And, and you know, he starts spitting it out and lets the blood drip down from his chin for all, you know, added dramatic effect. This would not be the last Shawn Michaels springboard dive at WrestleMania out onto the announce desk where the table did not break, or at least it didn't break instantly. In fact, they just replayed that match on Friday night with Michaels and Ric Flair from WrestleMania 24. Flair moved out of the way. Michaels hit a moonsault onto the edge of the announce desk, and it did not break right away. It kind of collapsed about two seconds later. But upon impact, that table didn't have much give to it. And that bump looked like it sucked. Michaels looked like he immediately regretted that decision. Could have broken a couple of ribs on that. That looked just brutal. That was a very rough bump in that WrestleMania 24 match. So Angle goes up top for a moonsault, and I agree with Johnny Gargano. Gargano said, I don't understand the physics of it. I've never seen a prettier, more just smooth, beautiful moonsault in pro wrestling than Kurt Angle's moonsault. It's like he he floats in the air. Guy, and Kurt's not like the biggest guy in the world, but he's no, you know, he's no munchkin, for God's sakes. I mean, Kurt's, Kurt's a big dude. And for him to sort of get the height that he gets and to float, even in, in TNA, you know, when he was really suffering physically and, and was battling all kinds of injuries, he was still having cage matches and doing moonsaults like a madman off the top of the cage. And even from the top of the cage, it, it was like he would just float. You know, people talk about Io Shirai in NXT. And Io Shirai has a great moonsault, but it's not as good as Kurt Angle. <laughs> it's really not. She doesn't get the kind of height on it that Kurt Angle does. Most people don't. So I'm with Gargano. I can't explain it. I don't know how he does it. But yes, Kurt Angle always had one of the best moonsaults in wrestling. Unfortunately for him in this match, he missed. He bounced. He, you know, Sean moved out of the way. And he went, uh, basically took a belly flop on the mat. Knocked the wind out of himself. My favorite spot of the entire match. My absolute favorite spot of this entire match. And I love the match itself is the super kick spot towards the end. The super kick spot followed by the trademark, what I call angle kick out. Kurt has Sean by the hair. Sean's on his knees. Kurt is looking down, yelling at him, tap out, tap out, give up. It's over for you, Michaels. Just tap out. And as he's yelling at him and he's got Sean by the hair, yelling in his face, Sean gets back to his feet. He gives Kurt a little shove just to put some distance between them. There was not a lot of distance between these two guys. Sean hit a super kick that was picture 
perfect right under the nose you know smack the thigh so it made the great sound effect but he kicked this fucking guy right in the face and Kirk collapsed the blood is on his face you know from from his mouth they laid there for a while Sean crawls over he gets the arm draped over him and I call this a Kurt specialty it's the Kurt Angle kick out because Kurt Angle had a knack for waiting too long on the dramatic kick out to get his shoulder up he waited a split second too long in multiple matches and it didn't look good everybody would be like come on you know the referee would have to hold their count up it was the same thing here he counted one he counted two and Kurt didn't get his shoulder up right away so the ref kind of had a hold and then Kurt got the shoulder up trademark Kurt Angle kick out but then he put him in the ankle lock Sean tapped out uh Angle said there were a lot of great matches at WrestleMania 21. Hey, don't forget, WrestleMania 21 was the first ever Money in the Bank ladder match. That was pretty good. I'd say that was a pretty good match. You know, Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio opened the show. Didn't have their uh, Halloween Havoc 97 match, but they had a pretty good opening match. But nothing could come close to what these two guys did here in this match. There were 50 people in the back giving him a standing ovation when they came back in through the curtain. And they noted at the very end that Sean skipped the uh, usual WrestleMania after party. He went right back to the hotel. He was with his wife, he was with his kids, and he said to his wife, he said, I am living the greatest life that any man could ever live. And he was getting all emotional retelling the story here. And he said, you know, my body should not have been able to do the things that I did that night. He says, my kids now are grown, they're, they're 20 years old and 16 years old, and they still think I'm pretty okay. Because I'm living the life a guy is supposed to lead, and I don't know what I've done to deserve that chance. But I am very thankful for it. The body of work that this guy has put together at WrestleMania over his career, going all the way back to the ladder match at Razor Ramon, is incomparable. There is nobody else that even comes close. You know, the match with Razor, Brett, Jericho, the triple threat at WrestleMania 20, the match with Kurt Angle, even the match with Vince McMahon, one of the best matches Vince McMahon ever had in his life. The retirement match with Flair and the story they told, the emotion there, and of course, the double shot with The Undertaker, WrestleMania 25 and 26. WrestleMania 25 being the greatest WrestleMania match of all time in the history of WrestleMania. That match was just, you know, Jim Ross summed it up best. Jim Ross, they brought Jim Ross in with Cole and uh, whoever else was, I think Lawler maybe. Lawler was there. But they brought in Jim Ross. Thank God they brought in Jim Ross because he, you know, lending his voice to that match made that match that much more special. And when the match was over, he summed it up best when he said, as a wrestling fan, how could you ask for anything more? That's what JR said. You know, Chris Jericho just did a watch along of that match for his podcast, Talk is Jericho with Marty Elias. Marty Elias was the referee for that match. Uh, he was fired a number of months later. He talked about that too at the end, supposedly for a dress code violation because they had the whole dress code dress code uh, enforcement back then. He showed up one day; he was wearing a Metallica T-shirt, and Johnny Ace called him out on it. And there may have been other political things going on, but he claims that he was fired for violating the dress code. But uh, he, you know, he's gone on to work uh, Lucha Underground as a referee. He's been around a long time, and he was very friendly with Shawn Michaels. Maybe that rubbed some people the wrong way, but he got the referee spot for that match. And so Jericho had him on his podcast. He shared a lot of very uh, interesting little notes about the match. One of them being about the finish. Where Sean hit the moonsault off the top rope. Undertaker caught him in midair and then hit the final tombstone for the win. He said that all day, Sean was practicing that moonsault. He could not hit it to save his life. He couldn't do it. He was too far to the left. He was too far to the right. Or, or he would undershoot it. So they brought a crash pad in. He still couldn't hit the move. So they came up with a plan B. Sean said, look, we get to the match. If I can't hit the moonsault, if I realize it, that I'm off target, you know, on the way down, I'm just going to land on my feet. 
Undertaker is going to give me a boot, in the, boot to the gut, pick me up and tombstone me, and that's it. We'll go home. So later on, they get to the gorilla position. And Sean, I guess, is uh, with Marty. They're praying together in the back. And now they're sitting next to each other. Sean's getting ready to go out. And Marty just turns to him and he says, So, are we uh, still on for plan B? And Sean turns to him. He stares him right in the eyes. And he goes, We're not going to need a plan B. And Sean just gets up and goes on out there. It was as if he had morphed into WrestleMania mode. And at that point, he knew it ain't going to be a problem. And it wasn't. He hit the moonsault perfectly. Undertaker caught him and he pinned him. Uh, he also said that when Sean and Undertaker were in the trainer's room after the match, Undertaker literally just collapsed on top of the uh, trainer's table. Because he was concussed. He, he claimed he had a broken uh, collarbone, which I find uh, unbelievable because he wrestled another 15 minutes. Uh, but he says Undertaker was all fucked up from that dive. I knew about the concussion. I didn't know about the broken uh, clavicle. So Undertaker is just laid out on the trainer's table. Sean's on the other trainer's table. Marty is in the room with them. All of a sudden, Triple H comes walking in. He was getting ready to defend his championship that night against Randy Orton. In the main event, Triple H walks into the trainer's room and he throws the belt down. And he goes, how the fuck am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> Triple H, screwed again. By someone else stealing the show before his big main event at WrestleMania. Hey, at least they had enough sense to close the show out with Sean and Undertaker the following year and didn't put him on in the middle. Right? Because, I mean, let's be honest. Nothing was going to be able to follow what those two guys did. 